This morning we'd like to draw your attention back again to the 10th chapter in that 11th verse where Jesus declared, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. We have moved from an agrarian to an industrial society. And unless you understand that move, you cannot understand all of the social implications of that move. Jesus was talking to people who were basically living in an agrarian society. He used similes that were familiar to them, meaningful to them. When David said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, and he relates his feelings towards God as a shepherd watching over the sheep. He was relating from the culture that was basically an agrarian culture. 90% of the people involved in farm work or related industries to the farm. And thus, it was easily understood by them. Today, if David were writing, he would probably say, the Lord is the owner of the corporation that I work for, and he has helped me in a profit-sharing program. And we would better relate because of our industrial society. Back at the turn of the century, almost 90% of the people were still involved in agriculture. Today, in the United States, around 5% of the people are involved in agriculture. So that having moved from the agrarian society... It has tremendous sociological implications. For instance, in an agrarian society, every child that is born represents an asset. It's worth about $16,000 in labor before it moves out and gets on its own. So the farmer would look around at the table at the 11, 12 kids sitting there and he'd say, I'm really rich, you know. Because each of these children in the labor on the farm, the chores and so forth, were an asset. They were worth money. But living in this industrial society, Every child that is born represents a liability of almost $65,000 until he gets through high school. So people look at the birth of a child in a very different way. Abortion could never have become a common practice in an agrarian society. It's only because of our industrial society that such a horrible thing is tolerated. We cannot understand child abuse. We cannot understand parents deserting their children. Because we don't see those social implications of the move from the agrarian to the industrial society. When it used to be in the agrarian society, a child was born and say, oh, great, you know. That's good. Worth $16,000 to me by the time I get it through high school. Today, the child is born and think, wow, who needs it? You know, 65000 bucks out the window by the time I can get him through high school. 
And so subconsciously there is an attitude. I was in Las Vegas speaking this last Monday night. And after the service, a little girl that I estimate to be around 11 years old came up to me. And I was immediately attracted to her because of her maturity. I mean, she was just a sharp little girl. She looked up at me and she said, would you mind praying for my mother? And I said, I'd be glad to pray for your mother. What's wrong with your mother? And she went ahead and told me of her mother's condition. But she was so clear, so straightforward. I was really attracted to her and drawn to her. And so I put my arm around her and I prayed for her mother. Later on, a man came up and he said, this little girl, he said, I've adopted her. He said, when I got her, she was living on the streets, sleeping in vacant, you know, in cars at night, just going around to find a car that was unlocked and sleeping in cars at night and living on the street. This sharp, sweet little child, deserted. And, and it's hard to comprehend The, this lack of a natural love for a child. It's impossible to comprehend if you do not see this sociological implication from this transition from the agrarian to industrial society. They call it evolution. I sometimes wonder which way we are going. But Jesus is using now the figure of a shepherd. Now, what do you know about a shepherd? You know, what do you know about raising sheep? What do you know about the characteristics of the sheep? What do you know about the relationship of the shepherd to the sheep? Probably very little. It's very possible that many of you haven't even touched the woolly back of a sheep. You haven't hugged one of those creatures. We know very little about them because we are pretty far away from the farm in this society. But when Jesus was talking with these people who were basically an agrarian culture, and he started to use this figure of speech and this simile, they were able to understand its full scope immediately. And it was extremely meaningful to them when he said, I am the good shepherd. Immediately that put an association in their minds that was warm and, and loving and great. Now Jesus speaks here of the characteristics of a good shepherd. And he said, he knows his sheep. That is in opposition to those who are not his sheep. He knows those that are his. Now to me, one sheep looks like another. I don't see that many distinguishing features in a sheep. It's just a sheep. But yet a shepherd can pick out his sheep. He said, well, that one's mine, that one's mine, that one's mine, you know. And, and, he, and he knows his sheep. He knows their characteristic differences from the rest of the sheep. And it does immediately show us that there are those who are his sheep sheep and there are those who are 
not his sheep. So men are divided into two categories. You today are divided into two categories. You are one of his sheep or you are not one of his sheep. You belong to some other shepherd. You're following some other guide. He said he knows his sheep and he calls them by name. That is, he has a personal knowledge of each one, being able to call them by name. The Lord often speaks to my heart about issues, issues of life issues of my relationship with him. I enjoy these times when the Lord and I have conversations with each other. And he calls me by name. And whenever he calls me Charles, I know I'm in trouble. <laughs> he knows his sheep. He calls them by name. And then we read that he leads his sheep to pasture. Now, the shepherd is concerned, and his primary concern is the well-being of his sheep. And thus he is seeking to lead them in the finest pasture available. Jesus expressed it here in his words, I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Satan has done a very successful propaganda job against God and against Jesus Christ. In that it is the opinion of so many people that to be a child of God is a life of deprivation. And the more you deprive yourself, the holier you are. So if you want to be a truly holy person, live closer to God than anyone else, then you go lock yourself up in a monastery and you eat bread and water and you spend your days chanting prayers and that's the height of relationship with God and spirituality. Not so. The Lord met the people in the marketplace. He moved among the people. And he especially enjoyed the parties. He came, he said, that we might have life. And that more abundantly. I have found that he has not taken away from me, but has added to my life immeasurably. We think of God depriving us of this and depriving us of that, but I have found that God has only added to my life infinite dimensions that I never knew before. How I thank God for that more abundant life that I have as my shepherd leads me into pasture and provides so well for me. Now, the good shepherd not only leads them into pasture, but he is committed to their protection. You see, the shepherd realizes that a sheep is a defenseless animal. 
it cannot run fast enough to elude the predators. Nor is it able to fight off the predators. And so the sheep are dependent upon the shepherd for their defense. Therefore, the shepherd at times will even jeopardize his own life in order to protect his sheep. You remember when David was trying to sell Saul on the job that he was able to go out and kill the giant. He said, look, I've been following my dad's sheep and one day a lion grabbed one of the sheep and was dragging it away. And he said, I grabbed hold of that lion and I killed it. Another time a bear grabbed one of the sheep and was dragging it off and I killed the bear. Now you must remember that David was only about 13, 14 years old. Yet with the heart of a shepherd, here's a lion that's attacking one of my sheep. He doesn't care for his own safety. His interest is in protecting the sheep. And he's willing to hazard his own life. Take on the lion. Take on the bear. Because they're a threat to my sheep. Now the Lord knows that I can't run away from the enemy. The Lord knows that I'm no match for him. I don't have any defense. I don't have any strength or power within myself. I have to depend upon the Lord, my shepherd, for my defense. And I'm so thankful that he's the good shepherd. And he does defend me. When Satan would rip me off, he's there. He's standing there and defending me. Now Jesus said, in contrast, the hireling, he doesn't really care for the sheep because he's just a hireling. And when the wolf comes, the hireling will flee. He'll run. His concern isn't for the sheep. His concern is for himself. There are today those men who are true shepherds over the flock of God. And then there are those men today who are hirelings. Now, the vast difference is the shepherds really care for the flocks and their main concern is to feed them. Where the hireling really cares for himself and his main concern is to fleece them. So it's easy to tell a hireling from a shepherd. The hireling is always emphasizing money and you're giving money and, you know, all of this pressure for money bit because he cares not for the flock but for himself. His desire to fleece the flock of God rather than to feed the flock of God. Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. And my sheep know my voice, and they do follow me. Now, they used to have these enclosures that were stone walls. And in the evening, the shepherds would come, and they would lead their flocks within these enclosures, and the gate would be closed. And during the night, the flocks would be sheltered in these enclosures from the predatory animals. They would be safe within the enclosures. And there may be many flocks within the one enclosure, as several shepherds would find shelter within the enclosure. But in the morning, as the light of day would begin to shine in the east, 
the shepherd would go to the door of the enclosure and he would call. And though all of the sheep were mingling together, his sheep would leave the rest and come after him. Now you may listen to his call and you may watch that uh, and think, oh, that's intriguing. And so you might go to the door and try and mimic his call. But the sheep won't pay any attention to you at all. And as you call, you might find them bolting from you and trying to run away. The sheep know their shepherd's voice. They'll only follow him. A stranger they won't follow. A stranger's voice they don't know. Now, herein is an interesting analogy. Because Jesus, as the good shepherd, is really called. And all have heard the call but only his sheep have responded. How do I know that I'm one of his sheep? Because I have heard his call and I've responded to it. I'm following him. All of the sheep may hear the call, only his sheep respond to it and follow him. He knows his sheep. You see, there are his sheep and then there are other sheep that are not his. His sheep are distinguished by the fact that they are following him. And when a person is continually turning away from the call of God, you always have that frightful prospect that perhaps he is not one of his sheep. And yet, no matter who you are, if you'll just respond and follow the good shepherd, you'll find that he has included you in his flock. Now Jesus said, the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. How much does Jesus love you? He loves you so much that he was willing to give his life for you. Now, this week, people are going to be looking at the cross once again as we come to Good Friday. Now, for some people, Good Friday is going to be just a real inconvenience. They get to the bank, and it's closed. How inconsiderate. I always cash my paycheck on my lunch hour on Friday, and the bank is closed. What am I going to do? And so Good Friday is going to be a real inconvenience and they're going to curse the bank for being closed because they wanted to cash their check. They're going to be angry. And that will be their response. To others, going to get the afternoon off. That means we can head out earlier for the desert with our dirt bikes and hang gliders. We get an early start. Going to be a longer weekend. Ought to be great. Good Friday. That's neat. I get an extra afternoon off. Whereas to others, it's going to be a day of serious contemplation as once again they remember the love of the Good Shepherd who loved them so much that he was willing to give his life for his sheep. And it's going to be a day of thanksgiving, 
a day of fellowship with God, a day of expression of gratitude for that good shepherd. It's interesting to me how people look at the cross and their response and reaction to the cross of Jesus Christ. As some people look at the cross, all they see is the horrible cruelty of man. And surely it is demonstrated there. I cannot understand the terrible inhumanity of man to man. I have difficulty with this. How someone can torture another person. How someone can abuse a child. How someone can deliberately hurt someone else. To watch someone suffer without feeling. I cannot understand this. I, I don't know what kind of a mind, what kind of an awareness or consciousness a person has who can do these things. I just don't understand it. It's, it's something that I've tried to understand, but I have no understanding. And because I have no understanding, I have no sympathy for a person who does those things. And when people look at the cross, many people are just appalled at the inhumanity of man to man, the cruelty of man, capable of inflicting upon a fellow human being such suffering. Other people, when they look at the cross, the thing that really strikes them is the excruciating pain that is endured by the person being crucified. And sometimes when you hear ministers talk about the cross, this is their emphasis, the pain that Jesus endured for you. And they'll go on and they'll describe, you know, in, in detail the pain. And this is the thing that really seems to hit them harder than anything else. There are others, as they look at the cross, they're sort of appalled by sort of a bloody, gory mess. And when they talk and describe about the cross, they seem to emphasize the bloody aspects of it. The blood that was from the crown of thorns, the blood from his hands, and the blood from his side, and the blood on his back. And it's the bloody aspects of the cross that, that seems to draw their interest. And chief response is, is to that awful scene. But when I look at the cross, the thing that strikes me harder than anything else is the infinite love of my Creator, of my Shepherd, willing to give His life for me. And it's the love of my shepherd that just totally wipes me out. He loves me that much. I know I don't deserve it. I know I'm not worthy of it. And yet he loves me. Loves me so much that he would die for me. I don't deserve that. And I'm overwhelmed and I stand there at the cross looking at my Savior just in wonder, standing in awe of this love that he has for me. He said, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd gives his life for his sheep. Now, 
Jesus was here actually prophesying his crucifixion, which would be taking place some six months later. This was during the Feast of Tabernacles, and about six months later, he was crucified during the Feast of the Passover. And so he's talking about his impending death. But when he talked about it, he said, I have the power to lay my life down, and I have the power to take it again. He said, no man takes my life from me. I give my life. And so as I look at the cross, I realize that he is giving himself, willingly giving himself for me. What is your response to the cross? Do you see it as another powerful argument against capital punishment because innocent men are sometimes the victims? Or do you see it as a shocking miscarriage of justice? Or do you see your shepherd laying down his life for you because he loves you so much? Jesus said, no man takes my life, I lay it down. When we come to the cross, six months later, and we see him there, we hear him as he cries, it is finished. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And then it said significantly, and he dismissed his spirit. Having said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit, he turned his own spirit and said, you may go now. And he dismissed his spirit. No man took his life. He gave his life. So that when the soldiers came around to break the legs, they marveled that Jesus was already dead and did not break his legs. They didn't have a chance to take his life. He gave his life. But he said, I have the power to lay my life down, and I have the power to take it up again. And the third day, when they came to that tomb, they found the stone rolled away, and the tomb was empty. And the angel said, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen just as he told you. I have the power to take it up again. And he took it up again and lives today. That he might be your shepherd. Leading you into green pastures. And leading you into his kingdom. I'm so glad. I'll tell you, I'm so glad. I know the love of Jesus Christ. I've heard his voice, and I'm following him, and I wouldn't want it any other way. And thus I can say with David, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. For he makes me to lie down in green pastures and he leads me beside the still waters and he restores my soul and he leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though one day I'll walk through the valley of the shadow of death, even there I will fear no evil because he's with me. His rod and his staff, they're a comfort to me. He prepares his table before me in the presence of mine enemies. He anoints my head with oil and my cup runs over. Isn't that what he said? I've come that you might have life and that more abundantly. What is the abundant life that he has? It's the overflowing cup. The overflowing cup of that life that is following Jesus as the good shepherd. Shall we pray? Father, thank you today for Jesus Christ, our shepherd. Thank you, Lord, for calling us.
calling us by name, including us, Lord, in your plan. How grateful we are, Lord, For the love that you demonstrated when you gave your life for us. Now, Lord, may we indeed follow you in your path of righteousness. In Jesus' name, amen. One of two categories, his sheep or not his sheep? That is the question. And you hold the key. If you will hear his voice and follow him, he will become your shepherd. And you can trust him completely because he's not a hireling. His concern is for you. And I would encourage you today to begin to follow Jesus Christ. You may like to go back to the prayer room, and I would encourage you to do so. It's in the corner of the building over here, the block wall, the door at the end there. Pastors and counselors will be back there to pray with you that you might discover the blessing of that more abundant life when Jesus is in control. Now may this week be a very special week for you as we once again remember how much God does love us as we look at the cross. May this be a week really devoted to relationship with God, a deepening of that relationship as we experience the work of his spirit in our hearts as God reveals his love. May it be a week of rejoicing as we look at the resurrection and realize that the hope that we have is not in vain, but it is a living hope because he rose from the dead. And may we live in that life of the Spirit, that newness of life through him. God bless you this week. Make it a rich, beautiful week walking in the Spirit. In Jesus' name.